hope is restored. And when hope is restored, purpose is found. When peace is found, hope is restored. And when we have hope, we start to dream again. There is vision. There is purpose. We set goals. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In John 14, verse 27, we can pick that up. We'll be praying shortly. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, KJV. Not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So we share the gospel to help others find peace, hope, and purpose. So for those who already have this peace, you know, for those who already have this hope, for those who have found purpose in Christ, we are recharged and built up. beautiful? Isn't that powerful? Let's quickly rise up and pick those two, three prayer points this morning. Let's pray. But while we wait for the point to come up, we can just pray after me, please. As we feast on the gospel today, oh, that's as we feast on the gospel today, peace is found, hope is restored, and purpose is restored. In the name of Jesus, as we feast on the gospel today, hope is found, peace is found, and purpose is restored. Purpose is changed in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray. You can personalize it. As I feast on the gospel today, oh, hope is found, peace is found. Oh, I find hope, I find peace. Le preto koto, hope is found, peace is found. All those who are watching us online find peace. They find hope, they find peace. There is purpose. They begin to dream again. They begin to set goals again. They begin to see who they are in Christ. And they begin to see who Christ is in them. So peace is found. Hope is found. As we feast on the gospel today. Hope is found. Peace is found. Peace is restored. In the name of Jesus. Someone praying this morning. I hope you are praying this morning. You can make it a bit louder. Hope is found, peace is found as we feast on the gospel today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Second one. Today, please say after me. Today, God's word brings me joy. You see, it's a season of joy. I came into the church dancing this morning. Eh? It's a season of joy. So today, God's word brings me joy, happiness, peace, and strength in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and declare those words. Today, God's word brings me joy, happiness, peace, and strength. God's word brings me joy, happiness, peace, and strength in the name of Jesus. I have joy. Oh, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. So today, God's word brings me joy. God's word brings me happiness. God's word brings me peace. God's word brings me strength. God's word brings me fulfillment. God's word brings me vision. In the name of Jesus, today, God's word brings me joy. God's word brings me happiness. In the name of Jesus, today, God's word brings me joy. God's word brings me happiness. God's word brings me rest. In the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Father. Amen. The last one for now. Throughout 2024, word throughout this year i have reasons to rejoice i have reasons to rejoice i have reasons to be happy i have reasons to rejoice throughout this year i have reasons to rejoice what you are saying is good things happen to you throughout this year what you are saying is there are testimonies around you in your life throughout this year i have reasons to rejoice Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say something beautiful to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, you look beautiful. Neighbor, you look like the worship of God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Just lift your hands to God this morning and say, I sing praises to your name, oh God. I give you worship that only you deserve. You deserve all the praise. I want you to say something that God can hear. Come on, come on. Just worship God because he's here with us already. to your name.
in you forever and ever forever and ever we won't stop praising you jesus we won't stop loving you yeah Come 
no one can love us like you. All the praise belongs to you. We rejoice in your faithfulness this morning. In Jesus' name we have worshipped and prayed. Amen. We can have our seats, please. I was going to go deeper into some worship, but I know we need to go into the word this morning. There is this, I remember there is a second phase of thanksgiving, so let's leave um, space for that. Um, so joyful and happy to experience Cross Point at four years. Praise God. How many people are excited? And that's been our assignment, but in this fourth year, what we decided was to push our mercy. Well, that's why we exist anyway. Upon this rock will I build my church, and the power of hell or the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The message of the church of Christ is the message of the grace of Christ. The gospel is the message of the church, the gospel of grace. And God has chosen the simplicity of this message to transform lives. Well, no wonder the enemy and religion have been at work morning, day and night, seeking whom they may devour. Well, we thought that seeking whom to devour just only means they would, you know, send arrows at you. Well, one way the enemy will devour you is to blind you. Blind you from a message. And that's what we've been teaching all along. The mess in the message is the power. When Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. In the gospel, the power of God is displayed. In the gospel, the power of God is dispensed. It is in the gospel we see God and his power at work. And this morning, my assignment is just, I'm John the Baptist. Yeah, I'm doing John the Baptist work today. I'm just laying a foundation for the message. You know, it's very interesting to note that in my journey still teaching about the gospel, I'm sure like you have, I encountered someone who was consulting with me and I had to start to teach him the gospel. And when I just looked at how religion had plagued a lot of people, including myself at some point, it's such a joy to have this message of Christ. You don't know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing for the veil to be taken away and to just be meditating on God's love. It's such a blessing to us. And in meditating and remembering this, my own journey of how I actually was under the law, passionately under the law, until I encountered grace. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard of the story. I got tired. It's not like even I wanted to change, but it wasn't working. Did everything I can to please this angry God, to try and get God to be on my side. What a terrible journey of life. Even if you see Jesus at the end of it all and you realize that all this thing was in what? So sad. Like you've been, all your life you have been trying to get Jesus on your side and Jesus was already on your side from the beginning. And he's now telling you at the end of it all. So it's important to realize that the quality of the message you hear in your church will be the kind of quality, you will determine the quality of mind you have. Sound doctrine leads to sound mind. The mental state you operate in is also very connected to the kind of knowledge you are exposed to. So when we say we are emphasizing sound doctrine when we say that the core assignment of a church is to teach 
is because you are a sum total of the knowledge you are exposed to. What we are saying is that your belief systems are primarily shaped by the exposure or the, expo the knowledge you are being exposed to. And that is why even Jesus is the one that is saying, Peter, see, Peter, you are geo. If you love this geo work, feed my sheep. Don't boil on them. Don't push them down. Feed them. Because maturity is not a gift. I can't transfer growth to you. I cannot transfer maturity to you. And again, we have shared here that miracles and anointing oil can never grow the believer. The believer is only matured when he is taught as newborn babes earnestly desire the sincere milk. It's the sincere one. The insincere one will not grow you. The sincere milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So there's nothing as more important than the teaching in a church. There's nothing wrong with AC, smoke, light. But some people, you don't choose a church based on the AC. You choose the church based on the doctrine of Christ in that church. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. If someone else comes to you and preach another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, so the message is not changing based on seasons. So when we have anniversary, then we we'll change back to another gospel, come back in Easter, go back to in Christmas, we change. No, the message is consistent because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means our message is the same yesterday, the same yesterday today, and forever. If you are hearing, shout, I hear. I hear. So if you preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, the Bible says, as ye have received Christ, so walk ye in him. How did you receive Christ? By grace, through faith. You didn't receive Christ by the law of Moses. So you can't keep Christ by the law of Moses. And the law of Moses is not just books and just letters. When we talk about the law of Moses, we are talking about relationship. We said the Old Testament is a relationship. The New Testament is a relationship. When we talk about the law of Moses, you can't keep Christ by your works. That's what it, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So you can't receive Christ by grace and want to get healed and live in victory by works. In fact, what you do is that you give access to the curse. Because cause is everyone that continued not in all of the law. So you miss one, you miss all, and you expose yourself to a curse. So he's saying if you come and you preach another Jesus, if, or if you receive another spirit. So in another Jesus, there is another spirit being communicated. Words, when Jesus says, the words that I speak, they are spirit. That means they go beyond your physical and begin to control other or outcomes of your life in a subconscious dimension. So that is why you have to be careful what you listen to. Because when another Jesus is preached, another spirit is in action. When another Jesus is preached, another influence is in action. When another Jesus is preached, there is a tendency to flow in seductive spirits. Because words are not just words. Words carry an influence. If you are hearing, shout, I hear. Yeah. So another Jesus will communicate another spirit, which is another gospel which doesn't release the power of God in your life. So no wonder we've talked about Mount Zion and Mount Sinai. Mount Zion, New Testament. Mount Sinai, where Moses received the law. 
On the day Moses received the Lord, 3,000 souls died. On the day the Holy Ghost fell on Pentecost, 3,000 souls were saved. The ministration of death, Lord, the ministration of life, Christ. So never take for granted what you hear and the message you hear. Ah, no, no. You see, I have seen one of the things that is a proof of what they call um, the calling or whatever thing we want to call it, my calling, my anointing, my assignment, is in this church, when anyone, whether the person is in ushering, media, protocol, they lead prayers or they are they are called to give a charge. The consistency of the message is clear. You, you, you will see, you see, Christianity and church is about discipleship. It's not just crowd. It's that because you can have a head and a crowd of people, just pick one person out and ask them something basic. They can't even explain Substitutional sacrifice, identification. You can't understand, they don't understand the Old Testament. But in cross point, when sometimes I hear, I said, wow. So the power is the, is the message, it's not the person. The message works from within, and every believer will respond to that message because that's Christ and that's his nature. So it's very easy to disciple people when you are preaching right doctrine. Manipulation comes because you are preaching a wrong message. Shout amen. amen. So 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, as I close my charge. For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, ears, you didn't say itching leg, but because this ear, the same way is to itch you. You know, before, you, know, you use cutting ball, whatever stuff, it won't go. Some of us have used pen. Don't worry. No, don't worry. Don't tell him. It's not you. It's your neighbor. But the itch still doesn't go. And that's what happens to us when we avoid the gospel. Ever learning but never coming to the truth. Always looking for new realm, new mantle, new anointing new pastor in town. But Jesus is enough. The gospel is enough. The, Come all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. If you drink of this of my own well of water, you will not test anymore. But the law will keep on giving us a fake um, and hopeless future that keeps you coming for more because they always, they always keep it secret or hidden. But God is no more hidden. Everything about God has been exposed in Christ. Friends, why I'm excited is, you know, in this short time that I've been preaching the message of Christ for three, four years mainly, I've seen preachers in America all over the place, they are preaching this message. Nigeria, and it's sounding the same. Why? Because the message is the same. There was a day I heard a, priest, a preacher, Dr. Derwin Gray, preach Christ, the gospel. I said, wow, I've heard Bishop Mike preach the same thing. They've not met. Why? Because the message is the same, is consistent, and it is the power of God at work in our lives. So, do not take it for granted. Your best option you have as a believer is to grow 
in the knowledge of Christ. And this morning, a minister and a leader in the house who, <laughs> who surely the gospel has transformed his life. I have seen, hear him preach the message of Jesus and it's coming from a place of deep conviction and persuasion, which is so powerful. And once the gospel is preached from a true heart and with true persuasion, lives change, people are healed, people see Jesus, and our lives will never remain the same. I want us with Jesus' joy to welcome on this stage a minister in the house cross, in Cross Point Church. Let's welcome Minister Jimmy Shomolu to give us a message this morning. Appreciate you, bro. Bless you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Please let's appreciate PL so much. Let's thank Pastor so much. Wow. <clears throat> I, <laughs> I don't really know how to begin, but God is going to help me this morning. You know, since Pastor sent the message during the course of the week, myself and my wife, our lives have not remained the same. <laughs> My wife was panicking. She said, you must rehearse this thing with me. We must do rehearsals. <laughs> and so we did all that. Thank you for rehearsing with me. Uh, this is a privilege of God. It's an eternal privilege to be asked to come up here and serve us the grace of God. And I thank PL so much. Let's put our hands together again. You know, if you've been around long enough, you know, childhood years, you didn't know much. But if you've been around long enough now as an adult, and you've already started seeing life, especially life in this country, you would know that good people are rare. You would know that. And if you've been a Christian all your years, grew up in church and all that, I mean, I mean, I don't know the numbers, but there's hardly, there may not be too many people here who came from another religion or from another faith. We may not have too many converted Muslims direct here, or Buddhists, or Judaists, or something, or native doctors. <laughs> but everybody here, almost everybody here, I believe, is coming from one Christian background or the other, coming from one church or the other. And you came here because you heard the message, the word of the grace of God that has transformed your life. And it's the same with me too. The word preached here by pastor and all the leaders is what has transformed my life. And it will always be a privilege. I bless the day I walked through the doors of Cross Point. I bless the day I met PL. I bless the day that I saw videos of the church on Instagram. And I just decided that, why not go to this place? Hallelujah. And it's been bliss, it's been rest, it's been joy in Christ. Let's put our hands together again. Amen. Wow. So, as we begin this morning, I want to read from Matthew 17, 1 to 9. We're going to read from Matthew 17, 1 to 9. I would have started from 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16, 17. But let's leave that for PL. I'm just a brother in church here. So let's leave the big ones for 
pastor who is our father in the Lord. I'm just a brother here, so I can't do PL because PL is the best PL that can do PL. <laughs> but we'll read from Matthew 17, 1 to 9. Amen. This is the account of the transfiguration experience when Jesus took three of, the, of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to the mountain. Matthew 17, 1 to 9. And here begins the reading of God's word. You know what? Let's read together. Read with some energy. And after six days... Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias, while he yet spake. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. And when his disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Amen. Amen. Wow. So, here is an experience that Jesus had with his disciples. And we've read the account now. And in verse, in verse 9, the Bible says Jesus charged them. Some other translations will say that he commanded them, he ordered them, he instructed them, he gave them a mandate. It was a, it was a sacred instruction, commanding them, ordering them, saying, do not tell the vision you have seen on this mountain to anybody. Until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So that vision was for an appointed time. The implication, the full import and significance of the Mount of Transfiguration vision they saw was for an appointed time. In other words, don't tell people about this experience you have had while I'm alive. Don't tell them while we are still under the law. The four gospels, the earthly ministry of Jesus, his earthly life was an experience that was had under the law. They were still in the dispensation of the law. And Jesus was saying, look, don't cause any controversy or anything. I'm controversial enough. I can imagine that was what was at the back of his mind. People want to kill me already. So let's help people save their hammers and nails. Calm down. Don't tell this experience to anybody until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. In other words, the Mount of Transfiguration experience, where Moses and Elijah were eliminated... And when we talk about Moses and Elijah, I mean, <laughs> Moses and e Elijah in heaven, where they are, their ears will be ringing today because they'll be like, we are in trouble in Cross Point Church. What have we done? Because I'm going to be calling their names a lot. But when we talk about Moses and Elijah, have it at the back of your mind that Moses and Elijah are metaphors. Moses and Elijah have become symbolisms which represent the law and the 
prophets, types, shadows, promises, prophecies, Moses and Elijah have become metaphors for the Old Testament. Moses and Elijah are metaphors for the Old Testament wrongly divided, wrongly interpreted. Amen. So when we say Moses and Elijah, we are not trying to say that those two individuals in themselves are bad guys. We are not trying to say Moses and Elijah, you are a bad boy. You are a bad boy. That's not what we are trying to say. We are referring to what they represent. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus is charging his disciples that this vision that you have seen where Moses and Elijah are eliminated and you see Jesus only. Amen. And you hear the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, hear ye him. Hear ye him alone. Don't hear Moses. Don't hear Elijah, hear Jesus alone. This experience, don't tell the vision to anybody until after the resurrection. In other words, the resurrection message is the revelation of Jesus alone. In other words, the message for the church, the message after the church has been born after, because the church is a product of the resurrection of Jesus. If you look at John 5, 46 to 47, TPT, or sorry, Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. The Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. So the church is a product of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. The church was purchased with the blood of Jesus. The church are a People called out of the world, set apart by faith in Christ Jesus, which, was, which could only be possible after the resurrection. Amen. So Jesus was trying to tell them, and I'm sure with their limited understanding then, they didn't really understand what he was saying. But with the lenses of Christ now, we can see that what Jesus was trying to say here is that the resurrection message, the message for the church of God, the New Testament message is Jesus. Not just Jesus, but Jesus alone. Jesus only. Because at the Mount of Transfiguration, when Elijah and Moses were eliminated, they saw no one but Jesus. Hallelujah. So the message of the church today is Jesus. Jesus is our message. Moses is not the message. Elijah is not the message. Moses and Elijah combined are not the message. Moses and Elijah and Jesus combined are not the message. Because if you do that, you will have a mixture. And that kind of mixture is what is responsible for the oppression, for the manipulation, for the darkness, for the, re for the religion that we see across Africa today. When you mix Moses, which is what religion has tried to do, look at the country over the course of the years. You will see that what religion has tried to do, what the voice of God interrupted Peter from expressing to the end, what Jesus was trying to tell Peter that they should not do is what religion is doing all across the world today. So religion has built three tabernacles in Nigeria today. 
one for Moses, one for Elijah, one for Jesus. And that's why you have the mixture. In fact, <laughs> what religion has even done is to kick Jesus out of his church. So Moses and Elijah are inside, but Jesus is outside. And he's having to now stand at the door. That's why he said in Revelations, Amen. You know, religion is wicked. Religion is oppressive. Religion is brutal. I, I came across a video this week online. Many of us would have seen it. Somewhere in Africa, you know, a pastor or a prophet was ministering to someone. And, you know, the person was, the man, the, a pastor was ministering or a prophet was ministering to a man. And the man was calling him Grandpa. Religion creates hierarchies. And the pastor was saying to him that, look, I'm seeing you somewhere. You are trying to move forward. You cannot. You need to give me all your money. In fact, the man asked him, how much do you have in your bank account? He said something, million or something. And he said, give all that money to me. And the man said, I will do it, grandpa, right now. So, Reli that's religion for you. An adult looks at another adult like himself. A man looks at a fellow man like himself. Tells an adult male, an able-bodied man, give me all your money immediately. And a man, an adult is saying, yes, grandpa, I will do that right now. That's what religion does. That's what religion does. And that's why in Revelation, Jesus is standing, if you look at his message to the church in Laodicea, I believe it is in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is saying, and remember, Revelation is a letter to the pastors. It's a letter charging the angels of churches, telling them, the things to be corrected. Telling them to take all the manipulation, to take Moses, to take Elijah, to take Jezebel out of the church and let Jesus only be seen. And Jesus is telling the church in Laos this year that, look, I'm standing at the door knocking. Let me in. Hallelujah. And that's why ministry gifts are so important. Oh my God. Kabadaba. Is someone getting this? That's why pastors are so important. Because in other words, the angel of the church, who are the pastors, are the ones who determine whether Jesus is inside or whether he's kicked out. Is someone seeing that? Through the message preached in a church, through the doctrine that a pastor allows in his church, that is what will determine whether Jesus is the message or whether Moses and Elijah are the message. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So Moses, Elijah, and Jesus are not the message. Jesus only is the message. Jesus plus nothing. Jesus exclusively. That's why Christ is our message at cross point. Because it is the revelation of Jesus that unveils the identity of the believer. When you see Jesus, you see yourself. When you see Jesus, you see who you are in him. Hallelujah. If we read from Matthew 16, 17 to 18 in the message. This is the account where Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? They told him. Then he asked them, who do you say that I am? And after Peter responded to say, you are Christ, the son of the living God. 
in Matthew 16, 17 to 18, the message, it says, Jesus came back and said, or Jesus responded, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of the books or from teachers. My father in heaven, God himself, lets you in on this secret of who I really am. Amen. Then Jesus says, and now I'm going to tell you who you are. Really are. So when you see Jesus in his resurrection for who he really is, you will see who you really are. Hallelujah. Colossians 3.4 TPT says, As Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed. For you are one with him in glory. Amen. You are one with Jesus. You have been joined together in life union with Jesus. In other words, when you and Jesus came together, you became one. You are a single unit. We don't know, we can't distinguish. We don't know who Jesus is. We don't know who you are. You have both been intertwined, joined together in life union. You are now one with him in his glory. Oh God. Christ is your identity. Colossians 3, 3 TPT says, your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. Your crucifixion. Did you hang on the cross yourself, literally? But it says your crucifixion. So the sacrifice of Jesus was substitutionary. He was doing it in our place because we can't do it. We couldn't do it. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. So your crucifixion, his crucifixion is your crucifixion. His death is your death. His burial is your burial. Amen. His resurrection is your resurrection. Oh God. That's who Jesus is. The king's man redeemer. He became man to redeem man. He had to identify with us in our humanity in order to redeem us. Because man sinned and man must die. Scripture says, the soul that sinned, it shall die. But those who sinned are those that God loves. And God says, he will become Jesus. That's why Christ is the wisdom of God. In other words, God in Jesus reasoned himself out of that predicament. Oh God. Jesus is the reasoning of God. Jesus is the problem solving of God. Amen. So when we see Jesus, we will see who we are in him. That's why Jesus is our message. That is why Jesus is our message. Because the one who died for the church must be the message of the church. The one who gave his life for us must be the message that we feast on. Because the life that we now have is not our life, but it is his life. And so we come to church to learn about the eternal life that we have received in Christ Jesus. Amen. Oh, Bragadasha. So let's consider a few riches that we have. Let's consider 
who Christ is and who the believer in Christ is. Hallelujah. Let's explore some of the riches, the treasures, the blessing that Christ is to us. Amen. When we see Jesus, we see that we are forgiven permanently for his name's sake. 1 John 2.12, KJV. 1 John 2.12, KJV. Paradabosha. It says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for your confession's sake, for your apology's sake, for your remorsefulness' sake, for your restitution's sake. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That is, through faith in who Christ is and what he has done to redeem us through the blood of his sacrifice. Through faith in what Christ has done is how we receive the forgiveness of sins. So, Christ Jesus is your forgiveness. That's why Ephesians says, in him in whom we have, not we are going to have, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So when we see Jesus, we see that we are forgiven permanently in him. When we see Jesus, we see that we are eternally saved. Hebrews 7.25 AMP. Hebrews 7.25 AMP. Amplified. Therefore, he is able also to save for how long? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Let's echo it. He's able to save for how long? Forever, completely, perfectly, for eternity. Glory. Those who come to God by him, seeing he always lives to intercede and intervene on their behalf with God. He's able to save completely, perfectly for eternity. So, look. Grace preachers and grace people, we are not trying to sound intelligent. We are not trying to sound controversial or anything. We are not trying to swim against the tide when we say that Jesus is the only message. When we say that the revelation of Jesus is who we are. We are not trying to be quarrelsome when we say that Jesus and Jesus only is the message. It's what the Bible says. When we see Jesus, we also see that we are righteous by faith in Christ. Hallelujah. Romans 5, 1 TPT. Oh, glory to God. It says, our faith in, in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us. Whose righteousness? So the righteousness that you have is not yours. The righteousness that you have is not yours. You didn't achieve it. You didn't create it. You didn't work it up. Your faith in Christ transferred God's righteousness to you. And he now declares us flawless in his eyes. Amen. This means that we can now enjoy true and lasting peace with God. All because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Oh, that's why we boast in what Christ has done. That's why we are the circumcision. Who worship God in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. That's why we are those who rejoice and boast in what Christ has done. When we see Jesus, we see that we have the irrevocable indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. John 14, 16 to 17, TPT. John 14, 16 to 17, TPT. 
says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Savior, the Holy Spirit of truth. Amen. Who will be to you a friend just like me? So the Holy Spirit is a Savior of the same kind, just like Jesus. And he will never leave you. And he, these are the words of Jesus. He will never leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately. You know him intimately. So we've said in church here many times that being the idea of being far from God or feeling distant from God or feeling that you don't know him is a myth. Just ignorance. Because the Bible says you know him intimately. Hallelujah. So why not acknowledge that you know him intimately? Oh, brother, da, 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 da. That's why the scripture says that the communication of your faith, that your Christian living will become effectual as you acknowledge every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. The Bible says you know him intimately because he remains with you and will live inside you. We have the irrevocable indwelling of the Holy Ghost. When we see Jesus, we see that we have a perfect relationship with God always. Amen. Oh, Romans 5 to TPT. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us what? A perfect relationship with God. Not a shaky one. A perfect. So there is no time that you don't have a perfect relationship with God. Your feelings not withstanding. It doesn't matter how you feel when you wake up tomorrow. It doesn't matter if you feel like God is far away or something, or if you are feeling dry. You know, we have how we describe all those things. There is no time you and God are not cool. There is no time. So, all the wrong mentalities we have are myths. Because our faith in Christ Jesus has given us permanent access into the marvelous kindness of God that has given us a perfect relationship with God. So, feelings notwithstanding, our declaration every day is, I have a perfect relationship with God. He lives in me. He remains in me. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. That's our confession every day. That's how we live. That's what we acknowledge. Amen. When we see Jesus, we see that we have authority in his name. Oh, when the believer sees Jesus, you see your authority in him. 1 Corinthians 1, 30 to 31, TPT. Sorry, Mark 16, rather, 17 to 18, TPT. Authority in the name of Jesus over negativity, over adverse circumstances, over this life. Authority in the name of Jesus. And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. <laughs> so, you know all those you want to cast out devils. Have you fasted today? So, you are not driving out demons in the power of your fasting. You are not driving out demons in the power of your works. We cast out devils in the power of his name. Not in what we have done. He says they will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. And they will lay hands on the sick and heal them. All because of what Christ has done. All because of what Christ has done. 
Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, we can stand here and talk about Jesus from now till his kingdom comes. Because you can't exhaust him. We can't exhaust the preaching of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why this 13-page message here, I didn't even know where to... When you see Jesus, you don't know where to begin and where to even put an end to it. So, I can't even finish the message because you can't even exhaust him. Hallelujah. Jesus is our life. Hallelujah. Jesus is our life. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, our eternal life. Jesus, our hope of a new body in the resurrection. Jesus, our righteousness. Jesus, our holiness. Jesus, our sanctification. Jesus, our justification. Jesus, our anointing. Jesus, our baptism. Jesus, our bread and wine. Jesus, our Sabbath. Jesus, our sacrifice. Jesus, our high priest. Jesus, our intercession. Jesus, our power. Jesus, our wisdom. Jesus, our God. Shout amen, somebody. Oh, that's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. It is Jesus that the law and the prophets talked about. From Genesis to Malachi is Jesus. It is Jesus that the four gospels talked about. It is Jesus that the apostles preached in all the sermons in Acts of the Apostles. It is Jesus and his finished work that the epistles are built on. Glory to God. Glory be to God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so, Jesus is our message. Because when we see him, we see who we are in him. Jesus is our knowledge, our definition, and our understanding of God. If not for Jesus, God would have remained abstract, unknown, and, mis and mysterious. Hallelujah. What a joy. What a blessedness. What a peace. What a hope. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 2 to TPT. Look at what Paul is saying. The church of Jesus does not have messages. The church of Jesus does not have messages. Because the church does not exist in isolation. The church does not exist on its own. The church is the church of Jesus. So the gospel and the message must be the good news of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 2, 2 TPT says, Paul is saying that for a while I was with you, I was determined to be consumed with what? How many topics? No, two topics. Three topics. One topic. One topic. Jesus is the one topic. He's our message. Jesus, the crucified Messiah. Jesus, the crucified Messiah. He's our message. The church, we are built on the revelation of Jesus. Because only when we see Jesus, do we see ourselves in him. Oh, glory to God. Let's rise to our feet. Hallelujah. And so what God is doing is that he is building strong local churches. I can tell you that. What God was doing is still what God is doing. Jesus is what God was doing. Jesus is what God has been doing. Jesus is what God is still doing. God is in the business of Jesus. 
So there is no revival outside of the preaching of Jesus and the revelation of the believer in him. That is what God is doing. And that is why Crosspoint has existed for the last four years until forever. Because we are out to reveal Jesus and to make Christ known. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, there's a song bubbling in my heart. Um, we'll change the lyrics a little bit. But it's a declaration of our dedication to Jesus the message. It's a declaration of our commitment to preach the gospel. It's an old time song. Lord, whatever you are doing in this season, don't do it without me. But we know that we are God's plan to populate and to dispense the fragrance of Jesus to the entire world. So God is not trying to do anything without us. God is going to reach the world with us, through us. So we're going to sing it, Lord, whatever, Lord, in all that you are doing in this season, you won't do it without me. Because Jesus is what you're doing. Jesus is what you're doing. Jesus is what God is doing. Li baragadosh kabarabadosha. And let that be our confession. Lord, whatever you do in this season, you won't do it without me. You won't do it without me. Oh, in all you're doing in the season, you won't do it without me. Won't do it without me. Won't do it without me. Let's take it higher. Lord, in all, in all your
Hallelujah. Somebody, can you rejoice in the room this morning? Come on, I can't hear you. Come on. Yeah. Sorry. 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 Can we for one minute acknowledge that was a powerful message? You know, it's so beautiful to know that you are now one with Christ. Yes. That Christ lives in you forever. So can we just acknowledge the goodness of Jesus for some minutes? Acknowledge every good thing that God has done for you. And say, thank you, Jesus, because now I live in you and you live in me. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. My soul will magnify the Lord. And my spirit praises his name for that could not hold up. Thank you, Jesus. My soul will magnify the Lord. My spirit prays the Lord for death could not hold him captive even in the grave. Jesus is Lord. Yeah. 
you ready to praise God? Yeah. Come on, jump those hands together and Woo. give the Lord a shout of praise. Woo. Hallelujah. Woo. Now move your body to the right and to the left. Separate me from your love, oh God. No lie, yeah. so now only you can shed my life. Oh yeah, hey. your love is uncomfortable. Mercy is unfundable. Let me tell about you, Lord. I cannot tell it at all. Let's go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, hey. yo, 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 yo. Oh God, he never
Hey! Wow! 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 Let's put our hands together for cross worship. Hallelujah! Wow! Wow! Cross worship, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Wow! Wow, that was awesome today. From the from the Igbo flavor worship in the morning, that was causing some holy intoxication. You know, the way the thing was just making you move. Cross worship, thank you so much. We appreciate your ministry. We appreciate the gift of God in cross worship. Thank you so much. We appreciate your sacrifices for the gospel. Amen. Please, let's be seated very briefly. Um, at this point in time, we will take the offerings. We give because we have received his love. And we give responsibly for the furtherance of this message. We don't give out of manipulation or compulsion here. We give responsibly in commitment to the furtherance of the work of the gospel. So our account details are up there. Please let's give. Let's give generously as God has prospered each one of us. We also want to welcome our first timers at this point. If you're worshiping with us for the first time, if it's your first time at Cross Point Church, please signal to us. Let's see you. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Let's show some excitement. Let's welcome them. Let's put our hands together. Thank you for coming. Thank you for choosing to be with us this Sunday morning. Hallelujah. I think we still have some people at this side. Thank you so much. Um, after service, we would just like to share a word briefly with you, just to welcome you and to tell you more about us at Cross Point Church here. Amen. Um, after service, the hospitality department is opening a food drive um, where, hallelujah, let's put our hands together for that. Hallelujah. We love one another at Cross Point Church here. We look out for ourselves. We share the love of God amongst us. And that includes generosity to ourselves. And so we are committed to ensuring that each member of church here is well taken care of and looked after. Just like we saw in Acts of the Apostles. Amen. So hospitality department is having a food bank open after service please um as many as would like to please just go there and pick whatever you want it's on the house it's free amen, amen. glory be to god next sunday we are closing out our anniversary match with a bank amen. hallelujah media will put the flyer Woo! we are having minister neon next week glory to god Hallelujah. Amen. You know, as I saw him, I remembered how much of a pressure week the past week has been for singles. Amen. Singles, are you doing okay or should we mind our business? Tension, tension, tension week. So we have Minister Neon with us next week, Sunday. As we close out our anniversary month, this March is going to be a blast. Please invite somebody, spread the word, amen. amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Let's rise to our feet at this point. As we share the goodness of God with ourselves, tell your neighbor, neighbor, Jesus is your life. Jesus is your peace. Jesus is your joy. Jesus is your everything. When you see Jesus, you see who you are in Him. 
You are perfect. You are complete. You are lacking nothing. Jesus is all that you need. Now point to them and preach to them. Say this week, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is all that you need to become strong. The word of his grace is all that you need for life and godliness. Have a blessed week, neighbor. Glory to God. Amen.